I'd like to thank Mark and um, FTD, not only for hosting me, um, but for all the great work that you do. Um, we rely on a lot of the analysis that FTD does. Um, <clears throat> it's enormously effective at what it does, deeply substantive, uh, passionate about its work, all the sorts of things that you would want um, in a think tank. And uh, we and many of my colleagues at the State Department um, rely on the work of FTD and its very thoughtful analysis. <clears throat> About two weeks ago, um, the PBS Frontline documentary series came out with an excellent two-part documentary on Iran. And there was an incredible amount of detail about multiple facets of Iranian life. And the documentary highlighted the condition of women in Iran. It profiled a number of women who are protesting the mandatory wearing of the hijab. And it became clear from the documentary that one of the symbols of the regime are vans that roam around neighborhoods of Iranian cities. And they're like the old truancy vans uh, for kids skipping school. Except in Iran, they go around and round up women who are violating the code of wearing the hijab. And then the documentary also uh, showed these courageous women protesting on top of city electric boxes about four feet off the ground. And then the regime's police thugs come and push them off. And these are anecdotes that illustrate what I'd like to discuss today. The revolutionary and repressive nature of the Iranian regime, the articulation of its revolutionary worldview at home and abroad, and why the Trump administration is executing a new strategy on Iran. It's important to begin by understanding that the Iranian regime is the last revolutionary regime on Earth. Uh, next year will mark 40 years of Iranians living under a religious dictatorship. The ideologues who forcibly came to power in 1979 and remain in power today are driven by a desire to conform all of Iranian society to the tenets of the Islamic Revolution. And the full achievement of the revolution at home and abroad is the regime's ultimate goal. At home, the revolutionary mindset is expressed through tight controls on almost every aspect of social behavior. I alluded to the mandatory hijab wearing earlier. The repression of religious freedom is a feature of this regime as well. And it is something that the Trump administration is calling out repeatedly. The revolutionary worldview means that the regime cannot tolerate any ideas coursing through the veins of Iranian society that would threaten them. This is why the regime throws a teenage gymnast in jail for dancing on Instagram. The regime has addressed, has, has arrested hundreds of Awazis, Baha'is, Darwishis, and other religious minorities when they speak out in support of their rights. Iranian Christians secretly flew to a foreign country and rented a hotel swimming pool so they could have a baptism ceremony. One man said he waited 10 years after his conversion to get baptized as a Christian. Such is the fear of reprisal from the regime. We are aware of the suffering of religious minorities in Iran. We will speak up for them. Our religious freedom ministerial at the State Department last month reinforced our commitment to speaking up for all persecuted peoples in Iran and defending their right to worship. Economically, the regime's economic mismanagement has put the country in a tailspin. The rial's value has collapsed in the past year. A third of Iranian youth are unemployed. A third of Iranians now live in poverty. Unpaid wages are leading to rampant strikes. Fuel and water shortages are common. And instead of using wealth generated from the JCPOA to boost the material well-being of the people, the regime grabbed it for themselves. And they used the money to line the pockets of dictators, terrorists, and rogue militias. And I'll discuss that more in a moment. 
The listless economic condition of the country is in large part attributable to a regime elite that resembles a mafia in its racketeering and its corruption. Two years ago, Iranians rightfully erupted in anger when leaked pay stubs showed massive amounts of money flowing into bank accounts of senior government officials. Sadiq Laranjani, the head of Iran's judiciary, whom we sanctioned in January for human rights abuses, is worth at least $300 million, thanks to the embezzlement of public funds into his own bank account. For years, the Ayatollahs have wrapped themselves in the cloak of religion while robbing the people blind. This is why protesters in Iran are chanting to the regime, you have plundered us in the name of religion. One Ayatollah worth many millions of dollars is known as the Sultan of Sugar. He pressured the Iranian government to lower subsidies to domestic sugar producers while he floods the market with his own more expensive imported sugar. This type of corruption puts Iranians out of work. The Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, has a $95 billion hedge fund. He tries to keep it a secret, but he uses it as a slush fund for his Revolutionary Guard Corps. The regime's greed has also created a great sense of disillusionment in Iran. In a world of social media and satellite television, today's youth are exposed to a range of influences far beyond the regime's control. And the regime's corruption and hypocrisy make it difficult for young Iranians to adopt the ideals of the revolution. It isn't 1979 anymore. The theocratic ayatollahs can preach death to Israel and death to America day and night. But Foreign Minister Zarif has a PhD from an American university. Supreme Leader's top advisor, Velayati, studied at another American university. And President Rouhani's first vice president wears a luxury Omega watch. This produces a disillusionment not unlike what occurred in the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s. Communism lost its appeal because of regime hypocrisy. Members of the Soviet elite were smuggling in Walkman and televisions from the West. How do you think Iranians feel when they see government parking lots full of BMWs and Range Rovers while well, they can barely make ends meet? Internationally, while I don't have time to detail all the destruction and instability, the regime has sowed over the past 39 years, we can see the effects of the revolutionary mindset across the Middle East and even the world. The nuclear deal was premised on the hope that Iran would moderate over time, that it would catalyze Iran into abiding by international norms. But Iran still applies, supplies the Houthis with missiles fired at Riyadh. Iran still supplies and supports Hamas's attacks on Israel, and Iran still recruits Afghan, Iraqi, and Pakistani youth to fight and die in Syria. Thanks to Iranian subsidies, the average Lebanese Hezbollah fighter earns two to three times per month more than what a fireman in Tehran brings home. In July, an Iranian diplomat based in Vienna was arrested for supplying explosives to terrorists seeking to bomb a political rally in Paris. While the regime tries to convince Europe to stay in the nuclear deal, it is covertly plotting terrorist attacks in the heart of Europe. We are heartened by the news this morning that our great ally France is indefinitely postponing all non-essential diplomatic travel to Iran because of Iran's role in this plot. That's the kind of action that President Trump and Secretary Pompeo welcome. We, we commend France for this step, and we hope to see additional steps taken from all nations to protect their own security. And continuing on that subject, here are some interesting stats for you. Iran provides Lebanese Hezbollah about $700 million per year. Iran has spent at least $16 billion on supporting its proxies in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. Iran has historically provided over $100 million per year 
to Palestinian groups, including Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Iran has extended at least $4.6 billion in lines of credit to Syria. Predictably, the Iranian people are sick and tired of the repression, the economic malaise, the foreign adventurism, the corruption, the squandering of resources on foreign conflicts, and the Iranian regime's campaigns of violence abroad. And so, the Iranian people have taken to the streets, shouting phrases such as, leave Syria, think about us. And the people are paupers, while the mullahs live like gods. The people in Iran are mad about a lot of different things. As a result of the failure of the Iran nuclear deal to effectively restrain proliferation or to curb Iran's destabilizing behavior, on May 8th of this year, the President ended America's participation in the nuclear deal. Secretary Pompeo announced a new Iran strategy shortly thereafter. And we have launched a multi-pronged pressure campaign that reflects the goal, his goal of protecting the American people and our allies and our partners from this outlaw regime. The first component of the Iran pressure campaign is sanctions. We have imposed 17 rounds of Iran-related sanctions, designating 145 Iran-related individuals and entities. This includes six rounds of designations just since the President's decision in May. The goal of aggressive sanctions is to force Iran into simple but hard choices of whether to cease or persist in the policies that trigger the sanctions. Regime leaders should feel painful consequences for their violence, bad decision making, and corruption. Necessary pressure means reimposing U.S. sanctions that were lifted or waived as part of the Iran nuclear deal. The first of these went back into effect on August 7th, with the remainder coming back on November 5th. We intend to get global Iranian crude oil imports as close to zero as possible by November 4th. As part of our campaign to stop the Iranian regime's funding of terrorism, we have also jointly disrupted with the UAE a currency exchange network that was transferring millions of dollars to the IRGC's Quds Force. We are asking every nation that can no longer tolerate the Islamic Republic's destructive behavior to protect its people by joining this pressure campaign. Another critical component of our campaign is the Secretary's commitment to exposing the regime's brutality and standing with the Iranian people. As the Secretary did during his trip to the Reagan Library, he will continue to engage with the Iranian diaspora, both at home and around the world. Our pressure campaign will continue to expose the regime's dirty revenue streams, malign activities, crooked self-dealings, and oppression. The Iranian people themselves deserve to know the high level of self-interest that fuels the regime's actions. What we are saying is consistent with what the protesters of Iran are saying. Ultimately, achieving the 12 demands that Secretary Pompeo laid out in May is our objective. First, Iran must declare to the IAEA a full account of the prior military dimensions of its nuclear program and permanently and verifiably abandon such work in perpetuity. Second, Iran must stop enrichment and never pursue plutonium reprocessing. This includes closing its heavy water reactor. Third, Iran must also provide the IAEA with unqualified access to all sites throughout the entire country. Iran must end its proliferation of ballistic missiles and halt further launching or development of nuclear-capable missile systems. Iran must release all U.S. citizens, as well as citizens of our allies and partners, each of them detained on spurious charges. Iran must end support to Middle East terrorist groups, including Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Palestinians and Islamic Jihad. Iran must respect the sovereignty of the Iraqi government and permit the disarming, demobilization, and reintegration of Shia militias. 
Iran must end its military support for the Houthi militia and work towards a peaceful political settlement in Yemen. Iran must withdraw all forces under Iranian command throughout the entirety of Syria. Iran, too, must end support for the Taliban and other terrorists in Afghanistan and the region, and they should cease harboring senior al-Qaeda leaders. Iran must end the Quds Force support for terrorists and militant partners around the world, and Iran must end its threatening behavior against its neighbors, many of whom are U.S. allies. This certainly includes its threats to destroy Israel and its firing of missiles into Saudi Arabia and the UAE. It also includes threats to international shipping and destructive cyber attacks. This is a pretty long list. But if you take a look at it, these are very 12 basic requirements that we expect from any normal country. The people of Iran themselves are angry that their country is not regarded as normal because of the regime's malign activity in, uh, abroad and its repression at home. As Secretary Pompeo said in May, the length of the list is simply the scope of the malign behavior in Iran. We didn't create this list. Iran created the list. The great objective of our pressure campaign is to get the regime to depart from all of this malign uh, action and enter into a new agreement with the United States that addresses each of these 12 areas. President Trump wants our allies and partners on board our campaign. Many other nations already have common understandings of the threat that Iran poses beyond its nuclear aspirations. This was clear in my negotiations with our allies and partners prior to the president leaving the Iran deal. We want more countries to join us in confronting the full range of Iran's destructive and violent behavior. Given the level of Iranian destructive behavior on every continent, we know they are ready for Iran to act like a normal country for the first time in 40 years. The security of their people demands it. As I close, it's worth remembering what the Ayatollah Khomeini said during his years of exile in Paris. He said in 1978 that the bases of an Islamic Republic are, quote, safeguarding the people's freedom and campaigning against corruption. And how's that working out? Clearly on the merits of the evidence, the regime of Iran has achieved neither of these things. It is deeply hypocritical. Ayatollah Khomeini also said in, 1970, uh, in 1978 that a future Iran would, quote, feature a government based on justice and fairness for all the strata of our homeland, end quote. The people of Iran, 39 years later, are still waiting. Look at the people on the streets of Iran today. To use the Ayatollah's formulation, all the strata are turning out to protest. Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini promised justice and fairness. The protesters know this is a regime of injustice and unfairness, which has failed to deliver on its promises. Ask those who refuse to wear the hijab how much justice and fairness they experience. Ultimately, Secretary Pompeo and President Trump are fully committed to our strategy of pressure on the regime, deterrence from bad behavior, and support, strong support for the Iranian people. And we hope that eventually it will become clear to the regime that changing its behavior and reaching an agreement that addresses the entirety of our concerns is the best option going forward. Nothing less than the security of the American people and a brighter future for the Iranian people is at stake. Thank you.